Thank you so much for your, for your kind words. And uh, I want to uh, tell you how um, honored and uh, pleased I am to be here in, in the Institute. I, I was um, trying to um, remember the last time I was here in, in Dublin and precisely visited the, um, the Institute with uh, the then uh, Minister for European Affairs, which was Pierre Moscovici. He has um, since then become finance minister, which is not maybe the easiest of tasks in the present days. I am now in Brussels, um, but the Institute is still here, and this is uh, something that I think we should uh, all um, cherish. I'm, I'm very pleased also to be uh, in, in Dublin um, a few um, a few weeks now, or let's say a few months before the, uh, the Irish presidency, and uh, I think this is um, uh, an event that will be uh, uh, something that we will have to follow very closely and for the ES um, we're very happy to um, look to be uh, looking forward for this um, uh, presidency because Irish presidency have always been very efficient and quite remarkable I must say um, and um, it is um, something that we're looking for um, can I add, um, but this is a secret that everybody knows in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in Brussels, is that uh, uh, the Irish um, are the ones who really control the institutions. Um, whether David O'Sullivan, with whom I work uh, on a daily basis, and who is a, a real dear friend, or Catherine Day at the, uh, in the Commission, we all know that Ireland has managed to do what all other member states will love to do is to have the real influence and to do it in a in a very informal way. Um, I was asked to uh, talk about uh, European diplomacy in a multipolar world and while I was thinking about what I could tell you I was wondering suddenly whether there was really a EU diplomacy. I think you are welcoming in the next few days Stefan Lenner, who is a dear friend also and who will explain to you that there is nothing such a, a European a foreign policy that all this is being ruled by the three main uh, member states. Uh, and then I was wondering whether there was really a multipolar world. I'll come back to that. So I wondered whether I shouldn't stop now and sit down <laughs> and wait for your question. But I'll try anyway to go a little bit deeper and as quickly as possible because I think it's quite important to interact with all of you and, and trying to answer your question. Um, I would just like to make my remarks around three questions, I would say. First one, um, related to precisely the title of this um, brief intervention. I hope it will be brief. It, what kind of world are we living in um, as diplomats? I would look at this only from the foreign policy perspective. Uh, and I think we need for a realistic and accurate assessment about the kind of world we're living in, which is, in my opinion, a world more and more complex and less and less stable. Uh, one word about complexity. Um, we all know that, for obvious reasons, we are facing a world that um, is more and more complex because we have new actors, the emerging powers. Uh, we have new challenges. Uh, I don't uh, want to list them all, but you can imagine it's easy. Climate change, um, the fight against terrorism, uh, immigration, and many other issues. And we're also facing um, new institutions. Um, uh, the G20, the emerging countries who are trying to build around what is called usually the BRICS, uh, some um, formal um, organization there also. Um, all this is, um, is testimony to something I think none of us really thought would happen. After the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, the idea was that we were going into a, a single polar world where one big um, um, power would um, um, rule more or less the whole of the international community. The reality is uh, that this has not happened and that we are in a totally uh, different um, situation. And this has created a quite complex situation we're going through. I, I don't want to spend too much time, but I would just like to give you one or two examples so that you understand the kind of difficulty uh, we're facing today 
whether as um, a European Union diplomacy or even as member states diplomacy. Think about Syria and compare the situation we're facing with Syria today with what happened, for instance, in Lebanon in the 80s or the 90s. Here, with the Syrian crisis, you're facing a, a situation where all the different dimensions of that situation are intertwined in, mingled all together and very difficult, therefore, to find a way out. You have local dimension with all the different communities fighting against each other and the uh, regime fighting against the uh, armed opposition. But you have also the regional dimension now where you have the, country, the Gulf countries uh, coming in um, with the support of uh, a Turkey and trying to push their, uh, their advantage there. And on the other side, Iran uh, and um, uh, being the one who is on, on the other side. And then you have the international dimension with America on one side, Russia and China on the other side, many of the Western countries also being on the side of, um, of, uh, of the United States. This um, combination of different dimension is something that um, is becoming more and more impossible to uh, untangle and to try to find a, a way through. Think also, and that will be the only other example I will give you, but I could give you many other examples in Africa or elsewhere. Think about the Arab Spring. We've had, in my opinion, wrongly so, um, the impression that what was happening since last year, what has been happening since last year uh, in the Arab world, this extraordinary movement towards democracy uh, and this uh, transition from the previous regime to something that is still in the making and we will see what will come out of this. The impression many got in Brussels is that this looked very familiar to what we had witnessed in the um, 1990s after the fall of the Berlin Wall once again when all the countries from Eastern and Central Europe uh, came back to democracy and, and moved uh, towards uh, their, new, um, their, new, um, their new history. Um, in fact, if you look very closely, it's quite different, in fact. It's quite different because, in fact, with uh, countries from Eastern and Central Europe, there was a clear goal. It was about um, uh, getting into NATO and getting into the European Union. It was about enlargement. It was about accession. And it was, by the way, a great success story. But of course, you, as you know, this is not at all the same situation we're facing with, um, with uh, the Arab countries in North Africa or elsewhere. The other main difference, of course, is that at that time, uh, there was not much competition with the European Union. We were the single power that was very attractive for countries from Eastern and Central Europe. And we were in a sort of monopolistic situation, I would say, with regard to accession. Today, when you look at what's happening in those countries, when you um, discuss with these countries to see what we can do in terms of assistance towards development, um, economic or social development, sorry, you discover suddenly that Europe is facing huge competition from not only the countries in the area, Turkey or, or maybe Iran or others, but from countries like China, like Australia, like Brazil, like South Africa, that are coming in and proposing also their, their help and their assistance to those countries. So a very competitive world at the moment, totally different from what it was before. And at the same time, a world that is, as I was saying, less and less stable. Uh, when people are talking about multipolar world, what do they mean really? And that is a question I think we should ask ourselves every day because we tend to accept that um, reality as something that is there. And I'm not sure it is um, there as we think. In fact, one of the complaints you will hear more and more in this uh, complex world we're living in is um, about the lack of leadership, either for uh, uh, this uh, accusation being directed towards the Americans or towards some other of the emerging uh, country. Um, I wonder if um, this assessment about lack of leadership is not something that is more, glo more generally related to the nature of the global world we're living in, uh, where um, 
we are facing everywhere, in fact, and not only with some of the big powers, uh, we're um, facing everywhere um, a problem of, of leadership. Think about those emerging countries we talk about all time long, Brazil or South Africa or even India. India. How far does their influence at the moment um, reach um, in, in their own region? And are they really interested in being seen as the main leader of their region? Brazil is a very interesting example. When you go to Brazil and talk with uh, our colleagues in the foreign ministry, they are the first one to tell you that they're certainly not looking for some sort of uh, leadership in the region, that they have to take into account of all the sensitivities of the different countries around, and just think about Argentina, think about Venezuela and some of the other part of this Bolivian coalition. They are definitely uh, competing for influence also, um, and uh, the situation is much more complex than is usually said. And the same thing can be said about South Africa, about India, and about many others. So um, I think that when people are talking about multiple world or talking about a G2 or also, one should be rather cautious uh, about uh, assessing the situation in those, um, in those terms. It seems to me that what we are witnessing, and I will not try to um, go too far into that, is that we're witnessing um, a new international community in the making. It is um, going on, uh, it is slowly and progressively coming in, but it is fraught with instability and uncertainty, and of course we have to um, look at this and to see what is going on. Two phenomena that I find quite interesting is if you look at the regional organizations or at the UN, you're seeing more and more regional organizations slowly moving in, trying to exert some influence, think about the African Union and the way they have been trying to manage some of the crisis on their continent. Somalia and the Horn of Africa, um, Darfur, um, the Sahel, uh, recently the uh, crisis in the Ivory Coast, uh, whether it be ECOWAS or the African Union or some other uh, organization in the African continent. I think about the UN and the way, in a very contradictory way, we manage at the time of the Libyan crisis to come up with an impressive resolution, Resolution 1973, where um, the, um, um, the um, uh, statement about the, um, the need to protect civilian population was put in the forefront with the possibility, if necessary, for the use of force and at the same time afterwards, with regard to the Syrian crisis, vetoes from some permanent members of the Security Council that haven't allowed to um, improve on what had been done with this resolution 1973. So one step forward, one or two step backwards at the same time. This is the kind of reality we're facing. My second observation is that in this complex environment, where does uh, uh, EU diplomacy stand? Is it fit to play a role? Is it relevant even to some extent? Does it uh, simply um, exist? Um, being, uh, I hope, a practitioner and trying to be as efficient as possible, I will try to answer to that question, to this question, in, in the simplest way, just telling you what I see at the moment in, 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 in the um, in the post where, where I am presently. Um, it is, as I think, relevant, I hope so anyway, um, for several reasons. Uh, the first one is that you must never forget that uh, European foreign policy is nothing new. It started uh, on a very small scale in 1972, I think, with what was called at that time political cooperation. And it has been improving, enlarging, and reinforcing itself as time has uh, gone by. It has um, now a, a doctrine, values that are shared by all of us, principles, uh, statements on many issues, the Middle East, Africa, etc., that is there, that is a sort of treasure uh, that we uh, improve as we move on, and that makes uh, European voice a voice that has um, a real echo nowadays um, in, uh, in around the world. 
let's not mistake ourselves, even if quite often many of our partners in Africa or in the Middle East think we're not efficient enough that we should do more, they still think that Europe can help and that we are a valuable partner with whom they want to work. And that is another reality that I'm facing and that we are all facing every day in the ES, is that we're being called for by our partners more and more. Uh, whether it be, um, let's give you a few examples uh, that you're all, all aware of, but sometimes we forget it. Uh, think about the negotiation where it is the European Union that is in the chair. Um, the dialogue between Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, we're part of the quartet uh, meeting that tries to deal with the Middle East peace process with more or less success, I agree, but we're part of it. Um, the uh, negotiation on the uh, Iranian nuclear program, where uh, the High Representative Cathy Ashton chairs the EU 3 plus 3 group. Um, nobody um, has ever um, put this in, uh, in doubt, and um, more and more of our regional partners, of our strategic partners, ask us to come in and to help. Let me give you another example um, um, about more and more demands for um, uh, the um, European uh, diplomacy. It's, um, it's uh, for instance, our Asian partners in what are today increasing tension in the South China Sea, very far away from Europe, I would say, and maybe a, a place where we shouldn't get involved too much. But the truth is um, either uh, Vietnam, Philippines, Japan or others are asking us uh, whether we could come and maybe support them and bring our contribution uh, to uh, try to ease the tension um, as it is uh, going on. So uh, there is a demand for EU um, partnership, for EU support, uh, and in spite of the financial crisis, and I would like to insist on that, in spite of the fact that um, maybe our credibility has been affected, the feeling that uh, the EU governance is uh, having some shortcomings or some weaknesses here and there, we are still in the diplomatic field, at least the one I can speak for, we are still considered either by um, our partners um, in, uh, in Asia uh, or our partners in the Arab world or our partners in the Eastern um, Partnership Georgia, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and others, we have um, uh, calls and requests for the EU to be um, a partner with whom they could work. So maybe we have to be a little bit more assertive and a little bit less self-critical than we are all too often with regard to our own performance, um, I think. Last question, and I promise you I'll stop afterwards because I've been quite too long. Um, what's the role of the ES in the middle of this? If we admit in this complex world that the EU diplomacy has a role to play, what can the EES do? Um, I can only remind you, because I don't want to take too much of your time, and I'm sure David has covered that uh, a lot when he was here in, in the Institute uh, um, a little bit more than a year ago, um, the whole ambition of what was the Lisbon Treaty. Um, it was to uh, bring to the um, uh, common foreign and security policy, I would say, more continuity, more consistency, and uh, more comprehensiveness. In other words, and once again to make it short, it was about um, um, simplifying the whole system with now a high representative and vice president who is taking over the jobs that existed before with the commission or on the council side with the high representative, and with the um, help of the EES to try to give uh, continuity and consistency to our foreign policy. The rotating presidency now is um, not more anymore in the forefront. It is Cathy Ashton that shares the uh, different councils related to foreign policy. The foreign affairs ministers, um, uh, defense ministers, and development ministers. And uh, I think that even if we have been uh, 
um, I would say, quite often criticized by uh, uh, the press in, um, in, uh, in Brussels for not being uh, successful enough and for maybe having set up an, uh, an administration um, that is um, cumbersome, uh, um, that is uh, sometimes uh, clumsy. Um, what I detect from our partners from third country is quite interesting. Usually they are the only ones who don't criticize us and tell us that they're very happy to have now um, a DES and a high representative as their main interlocutor in, in Brussels. Once again, let's not uh, mistake ourselves. Um, our, third, our partners from third countries know when they need to go to member states and to discuss with them. They know very well that the DES is only complementary to what member states do. We have uh, our role to play and we have to stick to that role, but they know very well when they have to deal with the European Union and where to come and, and work with us. If you look at this ambition and you look uh, since then what we have done, the first thing I think we have to say is that it is an ongoing process. Uh, we're only at the beginning of what is going to be a, a, a long professional adventure and a history that um, will take some time to uh, unfold and to um, be, I hope, a, a real success. Uh, it's a huge task that we have started there. And I think all those that have come and have talked to you and that will come and talk to you about um, what the Lisbon Treaty is trying to achieve will underline time and again that we need patience and we need time. Um, we could have uh, done it another way around, as we did, for instance, with the European Central Bank, which started with a, a transitional process. It was the Monetary Institute, and that went progressively establishing the Central Bank as it went on. Here it was decided, and uh, I don't um, uh, in any way dispute uh, that decision, it was decided that from day one, the ES would start as such, fully fledged, hit the ground, and run immediately. And I think if we look at the success or the shortcomings uh, of what was decided by then, I think that on the positive side, one can say that we managed, I think, to um, run uh, the administration uh, as quickly as possible and without too much um, difficulties. Uh, we're sharing some of the working groups. The high representative shares the three council I talked about. We set up a whole network of uh, new EU delegations around the world that have now a major political role of coordinating the member states in third countries. We have uh, launched a culture for crisis management that didn't exist uh, uh, before and uh, uniting uh, around and gathering around the same table services from the Commission, uh, our friends from the Council, uh, and all the different parts of the EES. I think um, we have also uh, managed to uh, work with the different stakeholders of the EES, whether it be the European Parliament, the Member States, or the Commission, and we have established, uh, I think, good professional relations and, and we're moving ahead. Where are the weaknesses at the moment? I would say threefold. Um, one, and we need to be patient, it will take time, is um, blending the different cultures together so that we can all work as a, as a, common, uh, as a, as a common corporation. There's, a, there's still a, a problem of corporate identity, I would say, which is, which is I, I would say, natural. Um, for anyone who uh, works in the private sector and who is familiar with the, the merging of, uh, of different enterprises, this takes time. Don't forget that it took us more than one year, if only to be all together located in the same building in Brussels. Uh, um, for the first year of the ES, we were all scattered around the city in eight or nine different locations. When we wanted to have a meeting together, you can imagine the kind of ordeal we went through um, to do that. So it's about blending the different cultures, a few figures so that you understand. Um, we have uh, two-thirds of the staff coming either from the Commission, largest part, largest share of the total, and coming from the Secretariat of the Council, and one-third 
made up of uh, diplomats coming from national diplomatic services. Uh, you bring all these people together and you act, ask them to work in the same way. Of course, they come with their own experience, their own way of doing things. And you have to slowly make all these people share the same culture and the same, the same goal and the same identity. Um, I think this will be uh, the longest um, work to do uh, as we move along. Uh, but uh, I have no doubt that we will succeed in the end, if only because all these people work together and are getting used to um, working together. Uh, the second shortcoming, of course, which is something that happens, I think, in all the uh, European Union, it is um, um, being more efficient with our procedure. The European Union is, uh, as you know, uh, a complicated uh, institution, uh, institutional framework, um, that in fact nobody understands outside of Brussels to some extent, um, and that takes time. We're not a federal state. We're not yet a federation of um, national state, as it is said here and there. It's something different. And when we want to move ahead, when we're facing major crises, it sometimes takes a lot of um, efforts from all of us, um, a lot of strength to move as quickly as, as possible. Because we need to get the commission on board, with whom usually we um, have to uh, uh, tailor the right uh, proposals. We need to get the 27 member states of board, and they not always um, agree with us. We have to deal with complicated um, financial procedures, with complicated rules regarding recruitment or whatever it is. And um, the ES as such, when it was launched, hasn't got its own rules, its own financial regulation. We have to work with the ones that exist at the moment, in spite of the fact that we are an administration of its own, uh, neither commission nor council, and therefore we have to find our way as we move along. And I think the third difficulty, if, um, or shortcoming, as we're facing on, is that as we move on, we need to um, get a better strategic vision of what we want to do. For the time being, because that was what we needed to do, we needed to do to work on the daily business that we were facing, to cope with the um, events in the Arab world, to cope with the different crises in Sahel or elsewhere, uh, to work on the Balkans, on the Middle East peace process. And uh, all this we are doing, and I think, I hope we will do it more efficiently as time goes by. But we need to look a little bit further, to look uh, one or two steps further, to think about the three or four years ahead and how we can um, uh, try to uh, set up the road for the member states, uh, for the different stakeholders, in order to have a, a better comprehensive uh, view. In other words, um, I'm just asking for the benefit of the doubt for the ES and for all of you to give us uh, more time so that we can prove that EU diplomacy and the EU foreign policy is um, bringing a real contribution uh, and being really appreciated in, in the world we're living through. I stop here. I've been quite too long, and I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.